Um, let me just begin by uh, thanking Roger Hertog as well uh, for making this possible. Um, I want to also thank uh, David Rosner and the Center for the Study of the History and Ethics of, of Public Health who's, that's co-sponsoring this series. I thank you again for that, David. Um, I want to also thank Steve Morse, uh, my partner um, with this program this summer. This is the second year of the, uh, the Hertog Global Strategy Initiative. And I can't imagine trying to take on a subject like pandemics and public health uh, without Steve Morris at my side. So thank you, Steve. Steve is going to be handling more expertly than I could the uh, question and answer session at the end of this, um, at the end of this talk. I'll just say very quickly uh, why we're here, what the um, Hertog Global Strategy Initiative is all about. Um, basically, this is a program, a research program that brings together future historians, uh, future practitioners. Um, we bring them together with the idea that they will make history together. Um, we'd like them to. Um, we'd like them to, um, over the course of this summer, undertake independent and collaborative research projects, um, use new information technology, um, to help us better understand the history of public health and pandemic threats so that we can better manage the future. Um, and the idea with uh, taking on subjects like nuclear proliferation and terrorism last summer, this summer it will be pandemics and public health, next summer climate change and international security, is that we're taking on what we think of as some of the most important problems in world politics. But one thing that makes them so problematic is that they are so difficult to predict. Um, some would say maybe even impossible to predict when it comes to the next pandemic. Um, but I wanted to share with you one prediction just to point out just a few things about our speaker tonight, um, why I'm so happy to have her here. This is a prediction that goes back to 1972, and it was issued by um, a man who should have known, a Nobel laureate named McFarlane Burnett, um, who concluded, and I'm quoting again, that the most likely forecast about the future of infectious disease is that it will be very dull. <laughs> Uh, this is just one of a number of forecasts from that period about how it is it seemed that the whole specter of in infectious disease was fading um, because of disease eradication programs and, and a lot of other things. Um, but I, I think that the um, already amazing career of Peggy Hamburg shows um, how very wrong he was and how sadly, in a way, interesting, um, even exciting, um, the history of, uh, of the last 30 and 40 years has been in this field. More interesting all the time, alas. Um, so I want to, um, again, say how happy I am that she's here. I want to welcome her back as well um, to New York and even this neighborhood where she lived for a time when she was the youngest uh, commissioner of health in New York. Um, that was just one of a number of things um, that she's done in this field. Um, and even in the time that she was there, she managed to bring down the rate of tuberculosis um, by almost 50%. Um, taking on, for instance, um, some of those who thought that uh, uh, it should not be a priority, at least not in New York City jails. Um, she was somebody also who backed um, needle exchange programs and that way combated the spread of HIV AIDS. Um, she brought up childhood vaccination rates. Um, these are just some of the things that you, um, you learn about um, Peggy Hamburg when you just begin to read about her. There are a few things though that you wouldn't learn, at least not right away, um, things that I think are kind of fun. The fact, for instance, that um, she had to grow up uh, with very eminent parents. Um, and uh, I can only imagine what a challenge that must have been to have a father who's the president of the New York, uh, not the New York, I'm sorry, the Institute of Medicine and the National Academies. Um, her mother also uh, had been elected to membership. And when she became a member, as I understand it, this is the only example of a mother and a father and a daughter who all of them were elected to, uh, to membership in the, the Institute of Medicine. Um, and her daughters are not going to have it easy either. Um, they, as I understand it, are the only uh, children uh, who have on their birth certificates the name of their mother twice. Uh, not just as their mother, but again as the Commissioner of Health of, of New York. Um, so she continues to make things difficult um, by going on and becoming the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. Um, she has, uh, I think, even now, um, continued to see um, biodefense, biosecurity as uh, an important part of, um, of her concerns as commissioner. Um, but of course, she has a lot of other things to worry about now as well. Um, so the FDA, uh, just to remind you, um, even if it only has a budget of a couple of billion dollars, has to regulate about a trillion dollars worth of consumer goods. 
Um, it's estimated that 25 cents out of every dollar of consumer spending uh, involves a product or a service that's regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so really, I just can't imagine anybody um, better prepared to talk to us about uh, the problem of pandemic threats and more generally, um, the history and future of public health in this country and in the world. Um, so thank you again for Peggy Hamburg for coming and I'm really looking forward to hearing more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. A very generous and complete introduction. And it is true that my children are the only children in the history of New York City that have their birth certificate signed twice. And I actually turned down a job in Washington so that I could be sure <laughs> that they both had that opportunity. Um, but it really is a pleasure to be here and to uh, kick off what I guess is a, a lecture series that will go the course of the summer in conjunction with a, a summer school class that, that uh, you're all enrolled in. And it looks like it's going to be a busy and fascinating summer and quite an a outstanding group of, of speakers who will be uh, following at this podium after me. Um, you know, I, I have to confess that I, I don't talk to all that many groups of students these days. Um, the circuit I'm on is a little bit different, but it's always fun and I suspect that we'll have a, a livelier discussion. Uh, than in some of the settings uh, where I speak. Um, but so in, in many ways, I envy you know, all of you students that have the chance to sit and learn and listen and engage. And um, it's a time that I really do miss. I also, in some ways, don't envy you because you are the ones that are going to be inheriting I think some of the most complex and formidable public health challenges um, that we have yet had to face. So I'm, I'm grateful to professors Connolly and Morse that they are going to be exposing you to an aggressive three-month um, plan to prepare you for all the things that uh, we're going to be counting on you to do in the future. It is really a treat to come back to New York City and to be able to talk about a, a subject that is of great interest and concern to me and that I have long um, been interested in from many different perspectives. And New York City is very special to me in that this is really where I began my career in public health. And it's been a career that has taken me in many extraordinary but unexpected directions. I had always actually thought that I would pursue a career in academic medicine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really you know, quite focused in my belief in that regard. But as I was going through medical school and completing my residency in internal medicine here in New York, I realized that, that really it didn't feel quite right. And I decided to go down to Washington and learn a little bit about the world of health policy. And at the time, my chairman of medicine at New York Hospital said to me, if you're not back in two years to do your subspecialty training in endocrinology, which was my original plan, you will have thrown away your entire medical career. Mm -hmm. But I went down nonetheless, thinking it might just be a two-year stint. Um, and soon after I, I went down to Washington, I got a job working with Tony Fauci at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And I know he's going to be on your, your schedule later, and I know you're going to find him um, both fascinating and very dynamic. But that was an extraordinary job that really exposed me to the intersection of what was somewhat familiar, research and clinical medicine, with the broader world of policy. And I found myself getting more and more drawn into the world of public health, which really allowed me to work increasingly at the intersection of science and medicine and the broader world of legal, economic, social, and ethical concerns. A few years later, in 1991, I was given the opportunity to become New York City's health commissioner. And it was not a job that I'd ever had my eye on, that's for sure. But I was excited. Um, a little scared, um, but I said yes. My great aunt Winnie, who's sort of been like a grandmother to me, was completely baffled by the decision though. She said, how can you, after all this training, give up on being a real doctor? 
And um, she, she really was troubled. My father tried to calm her down a little bit and say, you know, just think of it that instead of having one patient at a time, she's still a real doctor, but now she has eight million. And now that I'm commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration, I sort of like to think that I have, you know, something over 300 million um, patients. Uh, and it is a big responsibility. But I really see public health strategy in action as key to achieving meaningful and enduring solutions to the serious problems that affect the health and well-being of our nation and of the world. And, you know, frankly, I've never looked back, and I mention all of this just to try to reinforce my excitement about the field and hopefully what you share as you're learning more and studying um, public health and hopefully trying to um, think about a career in some aspect of public health. The Institute of Medicine defines the mission of public health as fulfilling society's interest in assuring conditions in which people can be healthy, which means that the field of public health is uniquely positioned to address the complex interdisciplinary challenges of our world and to really impact on them in a substantial and sustainable way. This mission has its roots in the earliest of civilizations. The Romans, for one, understood the connection between good health and proper disposal of human waste. The Chinese developed variolation to inoculate against smallpox and other diseases. The practice of quarantine was used in the Middle Ages to contain infectious disease. You probably already know all of this, um, but it is striking, and since it's a historical perspective for this series, it's worth noting. We really have come a very long way since those early days and since, you know, the more modern pioneers of modern public health, um, since Jon Snow removed the handle from the Broad Street pump to stop the cholera epidemic and establish the science of epidemiology since Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur developed the first vaccines for smallpox and for anthrax, and since Sarah Josephine Baker led a team of doctor, mm. of nurses, actually, not doctors, door-to-door um, -door down in Manhattan's Hell's Kitchen to educate mothers, treat blindness, prevent sexually transmitted diseases, train midwives, and provide pasteurized milk. In the 20th century, the dramatic increase achieved in average lifespan has been widely attributed to public health accomplishments, thanks to such things as vaccination campaigns and sanitation, but also safety programs ranging from seatbelt use to occupational and environmental safety to smoke-free programs and nutrition education. So public health is a force to be reckoned with because it is a way of really inserting itself into so many aspects of our lives and their major rewards, both personal and professional. It was mentioned that when I was commissioner here in New York City back in the 90s, I saw the damage of drug-resistant tuberculosis and what it could do to a city's population. But I also had the extraordinary opportunity to really make a difference. Back in 91, when I took the job, New York City was reporting the highest TB case rate that it had had in almost three decades. And as was also mentioned, in many ways, a lot of people didn't really care. They saw it as a disease of historical interest, even though, as you looked at the numbers, they were growing in some communities in New York City um, were really um, significantly devastated um, by this disease, and it posed a threat for us all. Um, you probably all know that TB is an intrinsically treatable and controllable disease, yet it had reached epidemic proportions and with startlingly high levels of drug-resistant strains that were much more difficult to treat and to cure effectively. And it really took very little in many ways to make a difference, but it did take a well-designed TB control and prevention program, adequate resources, but remember it was costing the city a lot as well to let it go and to let it um, continue to grow. But it also took real political and programmatic commitment from the mayor and from others in leadership. But it was extraordinary. In only a few years, we were able to actually reduce the uh, percentage 
of the number of drug resistant TB cases by about 86 percent. So that was, that was really something I had never dreamed of. In fact, people had told me when I embarked on, on this effort that if we didn't address all of the underlying social issues and just tried to treat TB, we would make no difference. Um, so I think we demonstrated that while we, we cared about those underlying social issues as well, we designed a program that recognized how those issues, housing and addiction and concomitant disease, and of course the HIV uh, AIDS epidemic, impacted TB, but we were able to design a program that actually made a difference and brought the numbers down. And at the end of the day, it really was about the principles and practices of public health. And it really, I think, underscored uh, for me what my first boss, when I went down to Washington to learn about health policy, had told me, was Surgeon General um, Dr. Everett Koop, um, who in many ways remains a legend. But he once said, health care is vital to all of us some of the time, but public health is vital to uh, all of us all of the time. So, you know, since this is a bit of a historical perspective, you know, it's, it's well worth thinking about um, all of the victories that public health has had in our own little way in New York City, but the eradication of smallpox, the control of polio, the dozens of successful campaigns against deadly diseases. And while it's not actually strictly in the, the public health domain, it's kind of agriculture, but they relate. I read today that, that we've declared rinderpest yeah. eradicated, um, which is a disease of animal populations. But we still have a very long way to go. We all recognize that in the developing world, there's been a growing focus um, on the need for improved public health and the tremendous burden um, that infectious diseases, malnutrition, and poverty-related illnesses uh, take, killing millions every year, and um, of course, causing extraordinary preventable disease and disability. And in our own country, we still are at risk from both infectious diseases and, of course, increasingly uh, chronic disease threats like diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension that many have now labeled as being true epidemics. But it's not as though the developing world is immune from these chronic disease threats as well. I was of the generation that learned in medical school that the era of infectious diseases was over. Um, I don't think that's quite true, but I think what we have to recognize is that, uh, that in some parts of the world, the era of chronic disease is really taking off, and this is not a session to talk about that, but the issues of, of the growing epidemics of chronic disease in the developing world and the developed world would certainly be another interesting agenda um, for, for this, this, um, this class. But, you know, I think that, that today we really are going to focus on uh, pandemic disease, emerging disease threats, um, which really do represent a continuing area of risk and vulnerability in this country and around this world. And of course, as we live in an increasingly complex global world, a disease in one person's backyard, halfway around uh, the globe, can be in our backyard um, within a day. And we need to think and act in a global way. And we also have to sadly recognize that the opportunities for deliberate manipulation of, of biological agents to do harm in the form of biological terrorism, biological weapons, is a reality in the world we live in. And we really need to think about the kinds of comprehensive responses that we require to be prepared as a nation and as an international community. And that that collaboration, of course, must involve government, academia, industry, international organizations, and of course, the not-for-profit world. And FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, does have a particularly crucial role to play. And I think it might be helpful before going any further for me to give you just a little bit of a background on the FDA. It's not an agency that I think everybody knows much about, although I think recognition of the, the words FDA or the, the acronym FDA um, does in polling get a, a pretty 
high um, recognition. Uh, and for the most part, uh, the response to FDA is pretty positive in terms of trust and confidence in, in government um, agencies. But there was one survey that I saw shortly after I took this job that ranked us just above um, the IRS. Um, and so I thought, wow, you know, I guess I can only do better. Um, but the FDA was created back in 1906 when President Teddy Roosevelt signed the Pure Food and Drug Act in response to really a, a growing number of, of dangerous patent medicines that were on the market. And also Upton Sinclair's uh, now famous expose of the meatpacking industry. Um, there was considerable public outrage, um, and in response, Teddy Roosevelt uh, signed the Pure Food and Drug Act into law, vowing to protect the public against misbranded or poisonous or deleterious foods, drugs, medicines, and liquors. And then, interestingly, a, a few decades later, Another President Roosevelt, this time FDR, signed the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which really created the modern FDA. And today, the FDA really represents a very unique resource for our nation. It's a regulatory agency that takes science-based, data-driven action on behalf of the American people, and our mission is to promote and protect the health of the public. And of course, we take our mission very seriously. The FDA is responsible for ensuring the safety and efficacy and security of drugs, medical devices, vaccines, and biological products, as well as the safety of our nation's food supply, cosmetics, dietary supplements, animal drugs and feed, certain products that emit radiation, and most recently, tobacco products. Um, shortly after I became commissioner, there was a new piece of legislation that, that for the first time ever, gave the FDA the authority to regulate tobacco products and their advertising. And as was mentioned, these products make up somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of consumer uh, product spending in the United States. And I think it's fair to say with the uh, notable exception of tobacco, the products we regulate are products that really matter to health and quality of life and products that people really care about and rely on in some fundamental um, often life-saving ways. And, you know, I think without a doubt we have an extraordinary range and a unique set of responsibilities. All aspects of our mission are really crucial to the health of individuals and to the public health of our nation and increasingly to nations all over the world. And I think that, that this all argues for the fact that we really need to be recognized as an agency that fulfills this unique place in our, in our world, in our personal lives, in the health of our nation. And that if we don't do our job and do it well, there really is no other entity, no other agency of government, no other um, private sector entity or not-for-profit sector or aspect of the academic world that can really step in and do it for us. Um, and I think it's important to underscore this at a time when, when many are questioning um, the appropriate role of government and certainly many are questioning the role of regulation. With respect to the focus of this particular lecture series, the history and future of pandemics and global health, um, obviously I want to talk some about the FDA role and our role in preventing and containing disease outbreaks and infectious disease threats all over the world is really quite multifaceted. We approve diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines that come before us, but we also act proactively. Our scientists and policy experts have forged partnerships that have led to the development of novel products to prevent and treat outbreaks, and in times of crisis, we work on the front lines to do whatever it takes to protect those at risk. In fact, we have a long tradition of leadership in disease prevention and control efforts, even though it probably is not the first thing that people think about when they're considering the charge of our agency. 
And so I hope this evening to give you a little bit of a historical glimpse into the intersection between FDA and infectious disease prevention and control, both here in the United States and around the world. And when I'm done, hopefully to be able to talk about a whole set of other issues that may be of interest to you that are under the jurisdiction of FDA, but that I haven't had time uh, to, to touch on. So let me begin sort of near the beginning and try to frame some of our issues at FDA in a broad historical context with a few concrete examples. And I think it's striking to note that like much in public health, the expansion of our activities and the provision of important um, new authorities and roles for the FDA has occurred in the context of responding to a crisis. I mentioned that our very origins were in response to um, public concerns over adulterants and contamination of, of food and drugs. Um, I'll mention a couple of other sort of critical events that relate to infectious disease threats and disease outbreaks that have also been critical in the history of FDA. In the 1920s, an entire family died after eating canned olives that had been contaminated with deadly botulism spores. This was naturally occurring, um, uh, of course. But the tragedy uh, drew a lot of attention. The FDA then worked closely with the canning industry to change manufacturing methods and procedures in an attempt to eliminate the anaerobic bacteria from canned foods using innovations, at least at the time they seemed like innovations in manufacturing, such things as higher temperatures and longer processing times. Then in 1938, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act granted FDA direct authority to conduct factory inspections. And finally, after a 1972 incident involving more deaths from botulism, this time in canned soup, FDA enacted its first good manufacturing practice regulations to govern low acid canned foods. And that includes things like olives, but also green bean soups um, and other things. Um, and those practices are, are in place today. But it, it's sort of amazing to me, at least when I look at history, at how long it took to put in place some things that you know, seem pretty basic and straightforward and how it, at certain junctures in this activity, it was really considered you know, really quite extraordinary that, that an agency like the FDA would be stepping in uh, to tell industry how to do its business and then to create regulations to oversee something like good manufacturing practice. Um, in another example, in September 1943, the middle of the Second uh, World War, the federal government's wartime research agency asked the FDA to assume responsibility for testing each production lot of penicillin prior to its application in the war effort. And of course, uh, penicillin, which was you know, fairly new, um, was increasingly a critical medicine in the treatment of infectious disease in the battlefield. And at that time, U.S. manufacturers were struggling to produce adequate amounts of this new wonder drug. In fact, the U.S., in collaboration with Great Britain, maintained parallel programs to produce penicillin naturally via fermentation and through synthetic means as well to try to make sure that there, there could be a supply as industry was trying to, to figure out how to do this business. The FDA tested samples from each lot for potency, toxicity, sterility, and other factors. And if the samples met the standards that were agreed upon by the Army, Navy, and FDA, it could be released for use in the war effort. And then a much smaller portion was also um, used for research purposes, and also um, a small amount was kept uh, for application in the civilian community. Two years later, Congress passed the Penicillin Amendment which vested in the FDA the authority for certifying the drug, which by that time had become considerably easier to produce. Then looking forward about 40 years um, to a time that some of you in the room may remember, but not all, um, I want to say something about the FDA's role in the AIDS epidemic. And over this 40-year period, the FDA's role in um, the oversight of, of drugs and their manufacture, as well as um, their evaluation for safety and efficacy had changed quite dramatically. But in the early days of, of the AIDS epidemic, we 
really had no available treatments. Um, and those circumstances really led to some new and important ways of thinking which have had important continuing effects. I was in medical school back when the AIDS epidemic emerged and I remember, you know, very clearly after having been taught that the era of infectious diseases was basically over, watching this, this strange unknown disease emerge, mainly affecting uh, young previously, previously healthy individuals. Nobody knew what the cause was, nobody knew what to call it. I remember GRID, gay-related immune deficiency syndrome was one. Uh, 4-H syndrome was another because the main populations affected were those using heroin, hemophiliacs, Haitians, and homosexuals. But then by the time I did my residency in New York City, the virus that caused the disease had been discovered, the human immunodeficiency virus, and the disease condition had gotten its formal official name, AIDS, or Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And I was by then taking care of a lot of, of, of AIDS patients, um, but there was really nothing that we could give them. Patients were, were literally wasting away before our eyes, but there were no drugs available and we could only really offer supportive care. But in, in, in many ways, the world changed dramatically thanks to advances in research and the AIDS crisis, which began with a lot of you know, very vocal concerns about a lack of attention um, to the people who were suffering and their needs, really became almost a poster child for rapid drug development. Regulators and drug makers realized that responding to the epidemic would really require rewriting the rules and that delays in the approvals of drugs had immediate impacts for patients because they truly had no other options. The focus of individuals was increased by um, a loud advocacy community, um, protests by angry young patients and advocates who carried tombstones um, to the front of the FDA headquarters and some handcuffed themselves uh, to the uh, fence and uh, a few other things, um, you know, did get attention. Um, but but in, in truth, it was an extraordinary coming together of the advocacy community, government, and scientists to work together in common cause um, with, with industry leaders um, to, to really identify a pathway for the scientific study of the disease itself and um, pathogenesis and human immune response and where were the opportunities for targeted treatment and how could we develop and approve new drugs in a way that was timely, but also supported the important needs of safety and efficacy. And it really was quite an extraordinary time. I was at NIH, not at FDA, and I have to say that FDA got a lot more heat than we got at, at NIH. Um, but it really, it really made a difference, and, it, and success in rapidly approving treatments for AIDS really supported a transformative uh, culture change at FDA, which recognized that finding ways to achieve faster new drug approvals really was essential uh, to protecting and promoting the health of the public, and that especially in the case of serious life-threatening diseases and infectious disease outbreaks, new ways, new strategies had to be developed, and the so-called fast-track approval um, was put in place then, and it remains an important means of making life-saving therapies available in a timely manner. It's really crucial when we think about strategies to help make new promising therapies available in the setting of diseases where there are very, very few options for care, and it is an essential component of public health preparedness as well. And though many think of FDA as a clunky bureaucratic agency, in fact, we do know how to mobilize to respond to an emergency or a serious emerging public health concern, whether a foodborne outbreak or an unanticipated pandemic. Early last year, for instance, the emergence of the novel H1N1 influenza virus posed a very real threat to the health of millions of Americans and people around the world. 
and in the in the context of this um, emerging evolving threat FDA scientists investigators and other professionals had to mobilize quickly collaborate widely and think creatively to deliver medications personal protective equipment diagnostics and vaccines that that could help us with rapid identification of, of the emerging threat um, and also in, in reducing illness, uh, saving lives, and hopefully preventing disease. One key element was FDA's approval of multiple safe and effective vaccines against the novel H1N1 strain, which was done in record time, although not quite as quickly as we had all hoped, um, largely due to the intrinsic characteristics of the virus in terms of growth. The manufacturers produced the vaccine in FDA licensed factories, and the decision uh, was much discussed about what type of vaccine to develop and how it should be done, but ultimately the determination was made that we should use the same process, the same steps that were used every year to develop seasonal flu vaccines because it was a tried and true method. So. The process was begun. FDA played a role in creating the seed virus um, for the vaccine. And then, of course, we had a critical role in terms of monitoring um, the production process, inspecting the vaccine lots for safety, purity, and potency. And we collaborated with the CDC and other agencies uh, to monitor for unexpected or severe um, adverse events. But ultimately, uh, tens of millions of Americans were were protected by a vaccine that proved as expected to have an excellent safety profile. And, you know, we were fortunate that, in fact, the uh, H1N1 um, virus wasn't as, as um, lethal as some originally feared. So, in fact, um, it was not of a magnitude that, that we had all initially worried about and as public health professionals, we prepared um, for the worst case scenario, but we were delighted um, that it, it wasn't such a serious threat. But our involvement with the response to H1N1 um, involved some aspects that, that probably were less appreciated, but had public health importance. As the public health fears about H1N1 escalated, there were all kinds of crazy products that started to be marketed shampoos, herbal mm -hmm. teas, air purifiers, um, electronic equipment that you could charge yourself with, and dozens of other um, fraudulent products, including counterfeit Tamiflu. So our agency actually has the responsibility for monitoring and responding to these kinds of, of product concerns, and we took swift enforcement action to shut down these operations. Um, it was a little bit like playing whack-a-mole. There were um, many, many sites close to, a, I think there were about 80 different websites that we ultimately shut down, but you would shut down one and it would open up somewhere else. Um, but happily, most manufacturers did seem um, to, to respond quickly to our warnings and uh, we were able to to, I think, reduce the potential exposure of people to products that might actually have harmed them and to products that might have prevented them from taking other actions, including treatment that might have actually had benefits. And we also had an important role in making certain treatments that were not yet FDA approved available uh, in an emergency situation where it looked like there might be real benefit uh, to their use. One example was in changing formulations for pediatric populations uh, so that, that kids who didn't fit within the official indication for use of antivirals um, could potentially benefit from them or making an intravenous form of an antiviral agent, paramavir, available for seriously ill patients um, in intensive care units and requiring um, intravenous uh, therapy. And since 
the time of, we also uh, were able to get a new set of diagnostics available for use um, in a timely way, all under something called the Emergency Use, use um, Authorization Authority, which um, enables us with an appropriate database um, and assessment of risks and benefits to make these products available in an emergency. And then since that time, we've been working with many of the companies that, that uh, produce these products to actually get them approved new diagnostic tools, which are so important, um, medications. And of course, we are continuing uh, to work with uh, the scientific community and with industry to try to develop a better um, more modern uh, vaccine against influenza so that we don't have to be dependent really on what is now an outmoded um, and, and cumbersome technology. And as we, we do these things, we are, of course, always thinking about being prepared for the next challenge, whatever it may be. Um, just one other example. Um, I haven't been watching the time. so. Give me the hook when needs be. Um, in terms of some of our work that has global implications, um, last summer, some of you may know, a meningococcal A conjugate vaccine uh, was developed through the men meningitis vaccine project, and it was pre-qualified by the World Health Organization to ensure that it met international standards of quality, safety, and efficacy, and we worked with the World Health Organization in that process. Since the vaccine, which was manufactured by the Serum Institute of India, was introduced, now vaccination campaigns have been held in Burkina Faso, Mali, and, and Niger, and nearly 20 million people were actually vaccinated in six months, which is extraordinary in and of itself. And according to the WHO, the vaccine is expected to eliminate the primary cause of epidemic meningitis in Africa if introduced in all 25 countries of what has come to be known as the meningitis belt and will save as many as 150,000 lives by 2015. So it's a very important contribution. But there is a backstory that I want to tell you about. FDA scientists, specifically those in our Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, were instrumental in facilitating the development of this vaccine, not just working with WHO in the pre-qualification process. Um, they were able to develop a method called conjugation technology that can increase the immunogenicity and duration of protection afforded by a vaccine. We then established a cooperative research and development agreement with the Serum Institute of India and CBER scientists transferred the technology to the Indian scientists and provided them with technical support as they scaled up to produce the vaccine for millions of people. So for me, that's a wonderful example of our, our proactive role um, as a regulatory authority, but also as a scientific public health agency. And I think it reflects that in every realm of our work, importantly including in the realm of infectious diseases, we take both parts of our mission to promote and to protect the public health very seriously. Clearly, we always need to be prepared for the next threat, whether the emergence of an old familiar foe or the unknown or unexpected. In fact, as health commissioner here in New York City, it was when I really came to appreciate um, the importance of the study and practice of responding to emerging infectious disease threats and came to know the work of, of Stephen Morse um, and his extraordinary leadership in this area. But as health commissioner, I really saw that New York City was an important hub for issues um, that truly re represented global health concerns and that often were on the cutting edge of emerging infectious disease threats. Um, whether things uh, like HIV AIDS or the resurgence of tuberculosis um, to unexpected diseases like West Nile and of course to bioterrorism which came in the form of letters uh, containing deadly anthrax powder. Which brings me to the future part of the, the lecture series um, and looking ahead to how the FDA must act to protect the public from emerging disease threats for years to come. And this is a very serious task. 
After all, both deliberate and naturally occurring threats, specifically um, threats that may come uh, through Mother Nature, but threats that, that may be beyond simply uh, infectious disease, but reflect the threat of terrorism, certainly infectious disease, biological terrorism, but also chemical, um, radiologic, and nuclear threats. We, we have to recognize just how important uh, this area of work is and how it, it really must integrate with all of the work we do more broadly to protect and promote the health of the public. But, but certainly, these kinds of emerging threats are a special case in that they lead to social, political, and economic disruption in ways that go beyond the norm, and they have the potential to take a truly catastrophic toll on life and health. And of course, in our increasingly interconnected global community, uh, we, the United States, are not the only country affected, and we need to think about the ways in which both our nation and the world remain vulnerable. And there has been significant progress in thinking about the um, development of public health preparedness against naturally occurring and deliberate threats, but we still have a significant ways to go. From the FDA perspective, one area of major concern is that we lack the medical countermeasures that we need to combat both the known threats as well as the capacity to rapidly develop new ones in the face of emerging threats, and that really is not acceptable. If we're to truly protect the public's health, we need to develop the medical tools to ensure rapid diagnosis, treatment, and prevention in case of a real attack or a potential threat. And in the bigger picture, medical countermeasures really can contribute significantly to the deterrence of biological weapons development and use, and should deterrence fail, help minimize their consequences. The good news is that, that we are poised to make some important and exciting changes, and I'm very pleased and, and proud, really, of the growing role that my agency, the FDA, has played and will continue to play in implementing them. As part of a new medical countermeasures initiative that was announced last August, we at FDA are working hard to increase access to and availability of safe, effective medical countermeasures, which is an administration-wide priority and something um, that both the President and the Secretary of Health and Human Services have talked about and take very seriously. And at FDA, we're doing this in three major ways. By supporting the development of enhanced review and manufacturing approaches for the highest priority countermeasures, by examining the legal, policy, and regulatory framework, and by strengthening the science that we need to more efficiently develop medical countermeasures and to facilitate the evaluation of product safety, efficacy, quality, and performance. And this last effort in particular will allow FDA to identify and help solve the scientific challenges that hinder medical countermeasure development and problems that without solutions will continue to result in long delays in the face of a crisis in getting the products that we need. And that is something that must be a high priority, but it's, it's really a huge scientific challenge. Imagine how hard it is both to develop and to assess for safety and efficacy a drug or a vaccine or even a diagnostic when in fact the disease doesn't exist in nature or exists in very um, small quantities or when it exists is sufficiently serious and or lethal um, that to introduce studies in, in humans could put people um, considerably at risk. Also the challenge of trying to develop platforms, mechanisms of vaccine development, for example, that reflect understanding of the underlying disease process and the human immune response, um, but that are being developed to, to put in place when something completely unknown emerges, but will give us 
a significant leg up in terms of a rapid response to develop a vaccine that might make a difference. So what is clear to me is that we need to work in these difficult, challenging scientific areas, but that we really cannot do it alone. The scientific community must come together, government, industry, and academia, to ensure that we have the knowledge and tools to enable us to cope with the challenges of the future and to address the scientific uncertainty that we face. And in addition, we must learn to work in a coordinated and truly cooperative way with all the many partners and stakeholders necessary for effective preparedness and response. You know, one of the things that I've certainly learned over the past uh, two years in this job is that you know, the ability to accomplish so much of what is core to our mission, uh, and certainly the things that I've been talking about today, really requires creative partnerships and a commitment to truly interdisciplinary ideas. It involves a willingness to always sort of question the way we do things and understand um, whether there are, are, are better ways to get to our important goals. And certainly, I worry all the time about who's going to be doing these kinds of jobs and taking on these kinds of activities in the future, which is why talking uh, to students and being engaged in a lecture series like this is so important. I really do think that the, the world is changing and the challenges in terms of emerging disease threats um, and global health are both more daunting than ever before, but also more exciting than ever before. And the opportunity to really bring um, the best possible science to bear, uh, to understand uh, public health practices and what works and what doesn't, and to bring together perspectives that marry science, medicine, and public health with, with uh, development, both economic and human development, and with, with issues um, of, of security, both security in the sense of, of food security, for example, and making sure that people have access um, to what they need, but security in the sense of protection against uh, threats on both the national and international level. It all comes together, in my view, um, in public health. We have a unique opportunity uh, to really seize the moment. I hope that um, that in these you know, more formal remarks, I've been able to say a few things that are of interest to you and that we can have some discussion in other key areas. But most of all, I hope that through, through this talk, but, but importantly, the whole series that you'll be getting over the course of the summer, you will really leave with a sense of, in, of enthusiasm and hopefully um, commitment to public health as a career because it is extraordinary and I only wish that I had discovered it a bit earlier in my career. So thank you very much and, and let's do some, some questions. Thank you so much. We can call you Commissioner Hamburg again. So for, as always, I think a lucid and fascinating presentation. There's a microphone for those who um, want to ask questions. And you can ask them of, of and, uh, your professors yeah, well. as well. <laughs> so. uh, thanks for coming to speak to us, Commissioner. Um, I was wondering if maybe you could turn a bit to your time at the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Um, and um, in the past, you've talked about uh, the dangers of dual-use research, of research mm -hmm. either for um, defense against bioweapons or for medical research that can both be turned into research for offensive capabilities. Uh, and I was wondering, number one, if you think the kind of frameworks that we have um, internationally um, have been adequate, whether they were doing from the start, things like the Biological Weapons Convention to deal with those threats, um, which seem to worsen with new technology. And number two, um, now, given your time at the FDA, what really keeps you up at night? Is it mm -hmm. a doomsday terrorist scenario that seems to um, you know, make a lot of the plot lines of shows like 24, or is it something more like the 1982 Tylenol incident or um, lead in children toys. Okay. Um, well, with respect to the first part of your question, you know, I, I, you know, early on, you know, did raise questions about the need for awareness that as we 
advanced our, our knowledge and understanding of um, biomedical research and life sciences research and related um, emerging technologies, we needed to recognize that there were potential misapplications of this research. I think it's a continuing concern, and it's, it's not unique to the area of life sciences. I think, you know, almost every new technology that's been developed has had some misapplication as well. But I think it is, it was, it was very important to begin to engage in the discussions um, so that people doing the research, um, you know, recognized the complexity of, of, um, of some of, of the new capabilities and that we tried to develop, you know, some ways of thinking about it both in terms of training of young scientists and also in terms of, of frameworks uh, for governance and oversight in some ways. I'm, I'm not as close to that arena of activity as I, as I once was, but my sense is that while initially there was a lot of understandable resistance in the many parts of the research community that, you know, well, we're the white hats, mm -hmm. we're doing this research in order to try to find new treatments and cures, um, you know, how, how can it be that, you know, you'd be asking questions about misapplication. I think there has been a recognition that especially moving into areas that have enormous power, uh, including synthetic biology and advances in, in genomics and other areas, that we do need to be mindful. Um, it doesn't mean that the research should stop, um, but it does mean that, that we need, just as in other aspects of scientific research, we strive to, to balance both the scientific research needs with the ethical context in which it's done. Um, with respect to, to the Biological Weapons Convention, I think, you know, it's, it's been certainly a less effective vehicle on a global scale than many had hoped initially. Um, I think that there are many good elements in terms of the approach that has been taken and some of the specific areas that have been developed uh, as sort of components of how to, to, to strengthen the understanding of the fundamental issues involved. But I'm really not close enough to it now to, to comment on, on the state of the Biological Weapons Convention. Um, you asked another question that was a good, oh, what keeps me up at night? Um, <laughs> You know, and I do have many things to worry about, and um, every day there's something new to worry about, it seems like. Um, but I would say that the, the issue of greatest concern to me, really, um, is one that I thought about talking about in more detail uh, today, so you give me an opportunity, and that's the issue of globalization and import safety and the security of the global supply chain. Whether you look at food or you look at, at, at drugs and medical products, it's extraordinary how in, in just the last few decades uh, the number of products that FDA regulates come either in whole or in part from other parts of the world. Uh, in the food arena, it's about 40 percent of fresh fruit and produce and, and close to 80 percent of seafood, um, as examples, come from countries outside of our borders. And with respect to drugs, about 40 percent of the drugs we take here are actually produced in total somewhere else. For aspirin, it's 75 or 80 percent of all aspirin taken here comes from somewhere else. And about 80 percent of the active pharmaceutical ingredients in drugs used here actually mm -hmm. come from other countries, um, with India and China being among the largest sources, but it's, it's quite a wide array. For an agency whose initial authorities and focus really was, um, were developed in an era when you realistically could monitor the boats coming into port and roll a few kegs of molasses off mm -hmm. and inspect mm -hmm. them and then send them along, the world looks really very different, and we're now responsible for tens of millions of lines of products that come in um, to a very large number of, of, of ports, both 
um, seaports and river ports and, and through airports and border um, sites uh, coming from, uh, you know, probably 180 or so different countries and, um, and certainly com be products that are produced in hundreds of thousands of facilities around the world with very complex supply chains that may involve, you know, like on the food side, a, a grower, but then between that farm somewhere in the world and your fork, there are um, manufacturers, processors, um, packagers, repackagers, um, distributors, exporters, importers. So the supply chain is very complex and there are many points along the way um, for the introduction deliberately or unintentionally of contamination or adulteration. And it's a very, very serious concern and we, we live it every day. You know, small um, foodborne outbreaks or large foodborne outbreaks you know, are in the news all the time, and for those of you that follow mm -hmm. ProMed, can keep up with uh, mm -hmm. uh, breaking news, as Steve just commented on something that I thought I was privy to, but he didn't, but no one else would know. Um, but, um, but on the, the drug side, we certainly know that the, the threats are real in terms of both counterfeit drugs and um, the deliberate economic adulteration of products like heparin, a blood thinning drug that was contaminated um, and appeared to be associated with significant um, illness and some death, or the um, ethylene glycol in cough syrup that uh, didn't affect um, in us in this country but, but killed uh, many children in other parts of the world. Um, or ethylene glycol in, in toothpaste that was in this country and elsewhere. So we, there are very real concerns, and it's 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 a huge challenge for us to uh, really monitor the safety of the supply chain and provide the oversight that we want to to ensure um, the the safety and quality and integrity of these products. And really, the only way that we will be successful and the the path that I am very much embarked on is to develop a new p paradigm which, which relies on partnership. Partnership with our sister regulatory authorities, partnership um, with other key stakeholders including industry who at the end of the day shares a common goal with us of not having contaminated products um, that can undermine trust and confidence and um, their brand mm -hmm. and finding new ways to um, to introduce preventive strategies so that we're not scrambling after problems once they occur, but the tried and true public health uh, method of prevention to try to identify where are the greatest points of vulnerability and how can we shore them up. Um, and a big part of that uh, is something that, that I'm very committed to and just came back from a, a meeting of the APEC economies, the Asian Pacific um, uh, economies. Uh, where we signed a, a memorandum of understanding with the World Bank to really try to strengthen regulatory capabilities in the food safety arena in the developing world, both to address this issue of, of raising the quality and standards that foods are grown and produced under, regardless of where in the world that's happening, but also because strengthening the regulatory capacity provides countries, especially those with developing economies, a very important opportunity both to be able to ensure high quality um, and, more, and a more reliable food source within their own nation, but also to be able to support a key sector of their economy potentially um, and build up a export opportunity that can help their economic um, as well as human development. So that is, you know, really something of great interest to me and I think a huge issue for our country and other nations going forward. Thank you for coming. You stated in your lecture tonight that sufficient public health preparedness 
may deter biological weapons use. Could you talk more about this concept of deterrence? Why do you believe that public health preparedness may deter people? And who or what needs to be mm. deterred? <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think, you know, this is, you know, really focused on the issue of deliberate attacks using biological agents. And we know that, you know, many countries around the world, including our own nation at one point, you know, have been interested and have worked on biological weapons programs. And it's a very unique, asymmetrical threat, potentially, um, that you don't need, especially in the modern era of science and technology, a nation state to develop biological weapons, potentially. Um, and so it can become an attractive tool of terrorism as well. But it's really only attractive as a, as a, a weapon of, of terrorism if it can produce panic and terror and disruption of government and lack of confidence of the public in, in government and in critical um, institutions and take a huge toll on both life and um, the economic health um, of an area as well. And so if we're unprepared, it is guaranteed that all of those negative consequences um, can and, and will unfold in response to a, a, a large or even a small attack. But if we are prepared and we can mobilize quickly, or if we have the tools to put in place a prevention strategy before something ever happens, then the use of a biological weapon as a, as a terrorist agent is going to be a lot less attractive. And that's what I meant by deterrence. And I think, you know, in the real world, we have to take this threat very seriously. We know it has happened. It's happened over the course of history, and it's happened in our lifetimes uh, in this country. Um, many of the doomsday scenarios that, that people have talked about, and I've certainly played in a lot of exercises that were truly catastrophic using biological agents, mm -hmm. those kinds of scenarios haven't unfolded. Hopefully they never will. Um, and I think that as a nation it would be a mistake to completely organize our investments in, in public health and other investments um, toward addressing those kinds of potentially catastrophic threats. But I think it's very important for us to recognize that they are part of the continuum of serious infectious disease threats that we face, both naturally occurring and deliberately caused, and that we need to make sure that we have the various components of a comprehensive public health preparedness um, program in place that involves much more than some of the things I was talking about in terms of the FDA role, which is more really focused on, on a range of medical uh, countermeasures and helping to build up some of the, the scientific capabilities and the innovative products that are necessary um, to, to prepare and respond. Um, but I think it's vitally important. But at the same time, that, that these capacities are, are being built, and the last decade has seen you know, some significant investments, um, I think we want to be investing in things that will help to protect us against naturally occurring disease threats, because I think that we know that Mother Nature can be a very powerful terrorist um, in her own right, and that uh, for a lot of reasons, we will continue to be vulnerable to a, a set of, of known and unknown infectious disease threats. One of the big battles during the HIV AIDS crisis has been the pricing of the cocktail to cure it and who controls that. And as you know, there was a big, was a big fight about multinational pharmaceuticals versus the production of generic solutions to it, let's say in India. And I was wondering where we're at on this issue. What have we learned from these, these experiences and where are we at in terms of the policy of the government to handle these kind of troubling and vexing questions? Yeah. Well, a complicated set of issues. Um, and ones where there are, you know, good examples and there are bad examples in terms of, of industry practice and pricing. Um, the FDA 
makes its decisions about products that come before us on the basis of demonstration of safety and efficacy and, and pricing is not, you know, a criteria, but in terms of the overall access to critical drugs, therapeutics, vaccines, and other medical products, we all know that, that price is a huge barrier to appropriate use and especially in, in countries um, and often in populations that are, are most at risk, um, we have the greatest problems with getting, the medic getting access to the medicines that the people, people need. Generic drugs, obviously, has been a huge contribution to making um, important drugs more available. And in this country, the shift from innovator brand drugs to generics has been quite extraordinary. I think about 80% of the prescriptions written in this country today are for generic drugs, and that has you know, really brought down costs of drugs. Um, and of course, as part of the response to HIV AIDS, there was a major effort to, to make generic um, drugs available in the developing world, and, and FDA played a very significant role in that. And we approved um, through a mechanism that's called tentative approval, but it's not tentative, it's, but um, mm. uh, over a hundred, I think, um, different, different products um, as part of, of that effort to get more drugs to people who need them um, with respect to the HIV AIDS epidemic in, in the developing world. You know, a huge issue now and going forward is how can we, I was speaking really with my FDA hat on, um, uh, you know, how can we help support efforts to bring down the cost of developing new medical products and, and do it in a, a timelier way as well because time is money when it comes to, to, to drug research and development. And, and in my mind, that means applying better science to the process of drug development and review, and also for FDA to take a very serious look at our regulatory pathways and how can they be streamlined and modernized, partly through the use of better science um, and partly, you know, looking at business processes and, and what can be achieved. But, you, I'm sure, know the numbers, although there's debate about, you know, the sort of ballpark of the numbers, but it, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring a drug to market and can take, you know, a, a decade uh, to do so. And so I think in terms of looking at, at the world scene and unmet public health need, we need to find a better way. Okay. Um, you very briefly mentioned chronic disease like diabetes and hypertension. So I was wondering if you, uh, if you could speak a little bit more about that. My question is threefold. Um, first, what is the FDA doing to prepare for a chronic disease epidemic? And second, what are the military or state security implications of chronic disease on military preparedness? And thirdly, um, what are the public safety implications, in your opinion, of being relatively dependent on a pure supply of metformin and insulin? Um, well, let's see if I can remember all your questions. Um, what we're doing with respect to chronic disease is, is obviously trying to help um, uh, create a regulatory environment that enables new important drugs to be developed and, and brought to market to treat problems that are huge and growing, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, um, et cetera, um, as well as neurodegenerative diseases that are going to take an increasing toll, um, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and others um, with an aging population. Uh, we also, of course, have a, a very special responsibility for monitoring medical products throughout their life cycle, so not just helping um, the process of review and approval, um, but also ensuring uh, safety pre-approval and post-approval, and we're putting more attention and resources into 
post-marketing uh, surveillance and monitoring to enable us to identify safety concerns as they emerge. Drugs that are used for chronic conditions do present a very different profile mm -hmm. than antibiotics or antivirals for infectious diseases because we're talking about drugs that are going to be used um, often for the course of a person's lifetime once they have to start on those drugs. And so it's not surprising that there may be safety concerns that emerge not in the pre-approval process when you're dealing with um, a limited number of patients taking the drugs under very controlled circumstances. And then you're moving out to um, now um, you know, millions, tens of millions of patients potentially taking the drug. Taking the drug at the same time that they're taking other drugs um, because many people that have one chronic condition have many chronic conditions. Um, and also taking it for a prolonged period of time. So this notion of our responsibility for the life cycle of a product becomes increasingly important. Um, chronic diseases present somewhat different challenges than agents against infectious diseases also because we're not just trying to either prevent an infectious disease like we do with the vaccine or treat an existing condition, but we're also thinking about ways to slow the progression of a disease, particularly something you know, like Alzheimer's, but certainly you know, all chronic diseases, the longer you have them and the more severe they are, you know, the worse they are, the more debilitating they are, the more serious complications um, there are, diabetes being one good example. And so to study a drug's impact on the progression of a disease is also um, something of a challenge because you have to be able to identify and validate surrogate markers for the study of whether the disease is progression rather than having a clear endpoint of disease, no disease, you know, which is much easier to do with an antibiotic. So chronic diseases do create a number of challenges um, for the drug review and approval process and a number of challenges um, for the ongoing assessment of, of safety. Um, you asked about the implications of chronic disease for, for basically for, for the military and for war fighters, and that goes a bit beyond my, my, certainly my official capacity as FDA commissioner, but my expertise in general. But obviously, you know, we need to think about the needs of the, the military, not just in the context of things that they might be exposed to and we need to protect them from, which is a big part of the challenge and an arena that we work with DOD on all the time. But um, there are chronic disease concerns that need to be addressed. Now, of course, the military does screen its members. Um, and so certain kinds of chronic conditions would, would disallow you from being actually recruited uh, into the military. Um, but then there's also the question of are there exposures, environmental dis exposures um, in particular that, that could ultimately cause chronic disease and they're complex issues that have emerged in that arena as you probably know, such things as um, Agent Orange um, and, its, and its relationship to, to chronic syndromes of disease. Or, you know, in the current um, wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, we are now, you know, really dealing with a whole different set of chronic disease concerns that are very, very significant and, and really um, so damaging to individuals and their families, both in terms of the injuries that have, have resulted in, in loss of, of limbs from explosive devices, but also post-traumatic um, stress syndrome and, um, and traumatic brain injury that leaves these, these military personnel with chronic, lasting, often debilitating diseases in many cases where we have far fewer um, medical tools and interventions than, than we would hope for.
Hi. First of all, thank you again for coming to meet with us tonight. I think we all really appreciate it. Um, and second of all, thank you for your work that you do every day to help with global public health. Um, my question is a, a bit more of a historical question, I guess, the ones that have been asked already. Um, it's about the regulation of the blood supply by the FDA. Um, and I understand that um, when the um, AIDS pandemic first broke out um, in the late 70s, that there was a lot of fear about it um, and that the blood supply was regulated in a way that kind of reflected that fear um, with the deferral of certain community groups. Um, and I was wondering if you could touch a little bit upon how that decision was made um, to, to make those um, deferrals and the reanalysis of those um, decisions since then and kind of looking forward uh, what it looks like for blood donor communities mm -hmm. um, and, with the, and the blood supply. Okay. Thank you. Well, you know, protecting the safety of the blood supply is an important component of FDA's mission, and, and actually I don't think I mentioned it when I was talking about the long list of things that we do, but it's something that's, that's very important and can be quite complex. Um, complex scientifically in terms of what should we be screening for and do we actually have the diagnostics to enable us to meaningfully screen and how much risk is acceptable in terms of, of uh, exposures through the blood supply and do we have the framework for monitoring the public to know what may be some of the emerging potential concerns about the safety of the blood supply. Um, and then there's you know, a lot of, of issues about um, the management of the blood supply as well and we are very involved in shortages of different kinds of blood components and and how to address those and how to monitor to anticipate when there may be shortages and strategies to try to um, to mobilize uh, donors or production of certain components when shortages start to emerge so it, it's a such very challenging and important area uh, with respect to um, the decision making around a particular um, issue or, um, or potential component in the blood supply that, that would be screened for, there, you know, there is a process with careful analysis of the available data. Um, there's, there are mechanisms that go beyond you know, just the FDA in terms of, of the governmental uh, procedures as well as advisory committees that help us to sort out um, what is known, um, how good are the, the screening tests, um, the screening tests both in terms of identifying at-risk donors and the screening tests in terms of actually examining the, the blood component. Um, so that we can can um, get rid of of it if it's in fact contaminated, and and they're hard questions. And you know certainly HIV is well demonstrated to transmit um, through the blood supply, but there are huge debates about whether individuals who report to be practicing. Um, safe sex and have no other potential routes mm -hmm. of exposure in terms of um, intravenous drug use or um, whatever, um, whether they should in fact be allowed to, to donate. Um, and that is under discussion now in terms of should we, should we step back from the stringency of the current um, donation standards uh, but it's, it's being examined in a, a very careful, thoughtful way because there are significant risks uh, involved with, with changing the standards. There are benefits in terms of recruiting more potential donors and in, you know, intertwined with all of this is also the desire not to needlessly stigmatize a group. But there, there are donor restrictions for many reasons. I mean, if you travel in certain countries, you're, you're not allowed uh, to donate. Um, if you um, have had certain treatments, you're not allowed to donate. So there's, there is a, a, a whole range of, of reasons. They're all based on um, the best available science, but always recognizing that we're weighing, you know, risks and benefits and that it's a dynamic process and we don't 
lock into one way of doing it if circumstances change. And of course, as new concerns emerge, we have to put in place new screening measures and strategies as well. Thank you very much for coming, Commissioner. Uh, a little while ago, you mentioned barriers to international partnerships. I'm wondering if you could speak to what you would consider the biggest barrier to international partnerships, specifically in the event of a future pandemic. Um, well, you know, I think trust is always a barrier to partnership. And I think um, past working relationships or lack thereof can be a barrier to cooperation. I think a failure to recognize and act with an appreciation of the perspectives of different countries has also proven to be a barrier. But I would say that in my experience, in the work that I do um, through the FDA, that it's not so much about barriers, it's the eagerness for collaboration because we all are facing the same challenges. Um, we all feel that we're being asked to do things that are really important and really matter, but we don't have the resources or the international authorities to do all of what needs to be done. Um, when I work with various uh, sister regulatory authorities, there's a huge sense of desire to find new and better ways to share information, um, to work collaboratively, to find ways to harmonize standards and approaches is something that we talk about a lot, but we're actually moving towards not so much a focus on harmonizing in the sense of doing it the same way, but achieving um, an understanding of each other's approaches to dealing with certain kinds of regulatory questions so that we can have confidence in the outcomes and not just look at the process because in the, in the realm that I work in, sometimes we've gotten bogged down because we do things differently, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that one is right and one is wrong if you look at the outcomes. You know, one that, that I think is kind of interesting, um, certainly nothing I'd ever thought about before was that if you're looking at seafood safety, like of oysters, you can either test the oyster meat or you can test the water in which the oyster is grown. And um, there have been violent disagreements about what's the right way to do it. But at the end of the day, the question is, you know, are the oysters safe to eat? And I think, you know, so we need to focus on outcomes. You know, one of the things I mentioned is this notion of, you know, really strengthening regulatory capacity. And I think that in, from the FDA perspective, that is really, really key. And I think it has huge ramifications that go beyond just what matters for the FDA. And I'm very ex excited about that opportunity. And I think that um, when we can engage in that kind of activity, which is proactive, and constructive and really makes a difference to the countries that we're working with, um, then I think there's a greater willingness um, to collaborate in other ways. You know, for example, sharing of, of specimens has been an issue sometimes, um, you know, in the context of, of pandemic flu, certainly the unwillingness of certain countries, um, Indonesia, I guess, in particular, uh, to share the virus because, you know, they, you know, sort of what's in it for us and it's an understandable reaction that concern that, that the virus that might have been found in their country would go to helping make a better vaccine for others, but what about uh, their populations? Um, and so I think, you know, we also need to, to think about how can we uh, both collaborate and share information and, sh and share important scientific resources, but also find better ways to, you know, partner 
in providing at-risk countries, communities, um, and populations the support and help they need. Okay. One last question. Sure. Thanks very much for coming today. Uh, two questions. The first one is, when you spoke about the H1N1 vaccine, you said that tens of millions of Americans had it. I'm wondering why there wasn't hundreds of millions of Americans that had it. Uh, and then the mm -hmm. second question, which may be seen as related, which may not be seen as related, is I was wondering if you could speak to something that you said somewhat offhandedly at the beginning with respect to the FDA's, um, was it respect or uh, kind of recognition, just above the IRS's. Um, right. Are you doing anything to, to socialize the FDA within the U.S. And, and beyond? And if so, what? If not, okay. why not? Um, with respect to the first question, um, you know, vaccination uh, has always been an area where we have less success than we we hope for in terms of, of campaigns and um, and uptake. Although, for the routine preventable illnesses of, of childhood, the numbers are, you know, quite good these days, and that's reinforced by certain requirements, like of, of school districts, um, to have your, your children vaccinated. But as I'm sure you're well aware, there are um, sectors of, of our population and people around the world, you know, that question the value of vaccines and are concerned about potential side effects. And vaccination is a medical intervention where we take, in most instances, you know, healthy people, often healthy children, and expose them to a medical product, and no medical product is completely safe. So, so there's always been, you know, this, this issue about are we achieving vaccination targets, and certainly with H1N1 we had a higher goal. The other problem with the H1N1 um, response was that the vaccine came later than we had hoped, and it came after the peak, and it, and it came at a time when some of the, the concerns about um, the severity of the epidemic had begun to wane, and so people that probably would have, have eagerly taken the vaccine would have demanded it, in fact, no longer wanted it. Um, we, I think, did vaccinate at higher levels um, than in the past, but still it was underutilized, and we, we in fact, were left with, with unused vaccine. Um, uh, the question about FDA and, um, you know, our sort of uh, reputation and the trust and confidence of the American people, I think, is a very, very critical one. And it, you know, really is the linchpin of all that we do. Um, and it's something that I came in determined to, to work on. Um, and, I think we have made, made progress. It's interesting, internationally, FDA is really viewed as the gold standard. Um, uh, within the US, there is a, a something of a more skeptical public, although many polls still, in terms of both name recognition and support uh, from the public, it still ranks quite high. Um, but there was that survey that I mentioned that, that did get my attention. And I think that you know, we are often beaten up by the media on Capitol Hill, by various stakeholder groups, and by the very nature of what we do, it's hard to make everyone <laughs> happy. Um, but I think you know, the trust and confidence in our agency and what we do, um, the, the belief that we are a science-based, science-driven, agency, um, confidence in the integrity of our systems, all of that matters enormously. And it, you know, we initiated, soon after I became commissioner, a, a major transparency initiative to try to open up the FDA, because we've often been accused of being a bureaucratic black box, and really in a, in a systematic way tried to target key stakeholders in terms of what kind of information they wanted from us that they felt they weren't getting, trying to make our information more accessible, um, trying to be more explicit about what we do and why, uh, you know, whether it's 
putting more information up and linking to other websites about foodborne outbreaks, including when the concern is um, about the outbreak is actually over. Because one of the things we, we used to do a lot was um, get everybody aware not to eat peanut butter, but once the problem at the factory was resolved, whatever, you know, we never said, okay, it's, go, it's okay to go back. <laughs> um, but, but so, you know, outreach in, in those kind of ways and, um, but also, you know, really trying to reach target audiences in ways that we didn't before. Any of you that read the New England Journal of Medicine may notice that the FDA is constantly publishing articles now about decisions we've made trying to really lay out the basis of those decisions and provide um, more background on our rationale because I think it's very, very important that people understand what we do, the complexity of many of the decisions um, that we have to make. Um, but the fact that it's not arbitrary and capricious, which it may sometimes see if you're just looking um, from the outside in. And, you know, to me, you know, I, I feel just very, very strongly that the FDA is an agency that has been so neglected in many ways over decades in terms of the investment of resources uh, to support the, the critical set of roles and responsibilities that we have, and that year after year we are given new mandates and new responsibilities, um, but we are not given the resources that we need correspondingly to really do mm -hmm. our job. And I was just looking at the numbers yesterday in terms of the 2011 budget. Uh, and in some ways I can't complain because over the past couple of years we have gotten significant budget increases, but I view it that we're still sort of digging out of a hole and we're still in that hole, but we have gotten increases. But at a time with the 2011 budget, which was just resolved, and some of you may have tracked, the, the government almost shut down mm. in getting to yes on a budget. Yeah. Um, but we actually got a very, we got a real increase in our budget when many agencies, including um, the NIH, which usually is mm. the one that gets the significant increases, got a, an actual cut compared to their 2010 budget. We got an increase. Um, but I don't expect to be so lucky for the 2012 budget, which is being debated now, and we're looking at, um, at a very significant cut on, based on what the House just passed. But, but I was looking at the 2011 budget in terms of, of how much we get and what it means across the population of this country, and it's dollars that every American pays each year to support the budget of the FDA, and considering what we do and how much it matters, I really think we need to take another look. And I really feel it's a very important aspect of what I do to try to, to be an advocate for the importance of the agency, the unique contribution that we make, um, and the, the need to really pay attention um, as a nation because um, Failure to really adequately support the FDA and our programs will be at all of our peril. So we'll stop Thank on you. that. Thank now. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Please join me in thanking Dr. Hamburg for a wonderfully fascinating and, dare I say, inspiring presentation. And thank you all for coming and for all the fascinating questions.